OPEC decides to do away with the production quotas they were ignoring anyway on this energy edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. I am Sean O'Reilly here at Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Thursday, December 10th, 2015, and joining me in studio to talk all things energy and industrials is Taylor Muckerman and Tyler Crow. Guys, the gang's back together. Yeah, yeah about all, damn All time. together in the same place at the same time. <laughs> this is three it, weeks later? It felt kind of weird just calling in. It well, you like called in from call. Vermont, so yeah, I don't know I, what I, was up with that. I called in last <laughs> week. I was like, man, this is kind of weird. I just feel like I'm on a phone call. Could you hear him okay? Like, yeah. I've never called. Uh, it's, it was yeah, okay. It's just a right. different experience. Because I've had Technology. What? Technology, yeah. That's a... It wasn't Skype, so it was probably okay. Yeah. Even uh, Skype works well. That's what Ian does. Oh, here in... Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Learn something new every day. Uh, so before we dive into uh, basically the big company-specific stories of the week, we have got to talk about last week's OPEC decision, or lack thereof. Um, they basically kept production where it was. They actually did away with their quota. They're not cutting. Um, the interesting thing that I read was, according to the Wall Street Journal... Um, the group supposedly considered cutting production, but decided that a reduction, even of 5%, wasn't likely to push prices higher if non-OPEC producers, which make up two-thirds of global production, join in cutting. Said, <coughs> Russia is where they're really looking at. They're they like, we're not hint nice Russia, call. hint yeah. Russia. Yeah. Um, did you guys hear that rumor that uh, a you know, year ago now, when oil really dropped after that big OPEC meeting, it dropped from like 80 to 50 yeah, like or whatever. 25% a day. Um, supposedly... Uh, the Saudi oil minister met with Russia. It wasn't Putin, but it was might as well have been Putin. And Russia said they wouldn't cut, and so it was like, all right, yeah. and then boom. Um, do you guys think it's true that they actually consider cutting by 5%, and do you think it's true that um, even if they did, it wouldn't matter? As a group, I don't think they considered it. There's yeah, and that's the thing. Because like, Iran and We talk about them as... A single entity. Yeah. It wasn't really they're not. So so far from. Well, the, Venezuela was begging for a cut, right? They're, they're like were, herding cats. Yeah. Um, you have multiple members who have very very different agendas when it comes to these meetings. Uh, if you look at one of the things, like you were talking, this there was a Wall Street Journal article that did a very very good job of kind of highlighting everything that's going on in this, and I would encourage anybody to go read it. But um, one of the things that they mentioned, excuse me, was. Venezuela, Nigeria, a bunch of uh, countries that are struggling at this oil price. You know, some of the ones that don't have a large revenue source outside of oil. We're talking like borderline revolution in some Re of these well, countries. Well, <laughs> hey, so let's let's not get go that far. Sensa but, sensationalist. Um, what they were saying is, n you guys, you need we need to cut. We need to cut the quota. And so when the I guess you could say the more well financed ones, uh, Saudi Arabia, some of the other Gulf states, says cool. fine. Everybody, let's get together and agree to a cut. And then those smaller marginal ones says, "Well, well, well we don't want to cut. We can't. We can't do that. We're in too much trouble." And then they said, "Well, fine. If you don't want to cut, then why should we?" And it just it you know it's becoming a almost fragmented group. And if you look at what's been going on, I mean, they're they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot too. It's not just like you know they're not suffering. I think one of the things that they mentioned in that article is that Saudi Saudi Arabia is plowing through or burning through ten billion dollars a month yeah. from their, you know, slu not only I that, say but slush their, fund, but their currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. They're having to defend that. I saw this crazy thing like short bets against their currency because it's a peg. It's a free bet if they, you know, well, they also started out. taking debt out. In US I mean, it, yeah, they sold their first bonds in years. Yeah. Um, what? Um, why do you think? Okay, so let's talk about the the small producers. You're talking about the Venezuelas, the all those guys. Um, they didn't want to cut. They were like, oh, no, no, we want you guys to cut, and then you know we're in too much trouble. We can't cut. Um, the economic analysis as to why at some point somebody should cut or whatever is a 5% cut and the decrease in production and the revenues that would de uh, generate is assuming oil goes back to 80 or 90 or whatever, um, way less than the extra revenue, uh, extra revenue from the price doubling. That was the reasoning for Saudi Arabia, you know, eventually cutting or whatever. I, I read this a year ago now. But why didn't even the smaller producers realize that well, they would have to band together? They couldn't move the needle enough if Venezuela cut their production by ten percent. So cares? why aren't, why yeah. isn't Venezuela going along with what the bigger players want, which is everybody cutting? Is it just Russia? No, it, well, so yeah, like if everybody else in OPEC cut, other than Iraq and Saudi Arabia, 
like they wouldn't even be able to cut it as much as those two countries combined. Right. So they need more than just the smaller producers in OPEC. Um, Saudi Arabia wants Iraq and Russia right. predominantly to commit to cutting production because both of those countries are producing at record levels right now. Mm-hmm. So um, and Russia has been pretty forthright saying that it's just not going to happen. Um, and Why? Like, Why doesn't Russia be like? Is economics not their strong suit? Like, why don't they realize, okay, if we cut by 5%, the, we'll get double the money for the remaining 95 I think because there's, there's a lot, a lot of politics there's involved a lot as of, well. There's also a lot of oil that can come online at a $60, $70 a barrel that will capture market share. Yeah. You know, if we look at what's gone in the United States, we've gone stagnant in terms of drilling in the United States because oil has been so low, and we have reduced the break-even cost uh, from all these companies getting desperate and trying to find new ways to yeah. to um, you know, drill, that we could become much more economical in that 60 and 70 range, and that we could see we could be the ones to kind of fill that gap very quickly if it were to uh, if prices were to start to rise again. And one of the big reasons they continue to do this is to maintain pressure on those pent up sources of demand mm. and preserve market share. So it seems to me like the bottom line of this is the only saving grace then, if OPEC's bent on crushing higher cost producers like us, uh, you know, when I say us, I mean US shale producers, is demand. Uh, well, demand rose faster in 2015 yeah. than it did in, in several in the past As it half a decade or more. Half, so. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that and uh, you know, countries are catching up t- to the to the fact that oil helps build economies. Um, it helped us. Uh, I think that a lot of countries are asking themselves, why the heck should we be set back having to now take all of our cash that we've poured into oil and gas infrastructure and then charge head on into renewables when America and China yeah. and Europe got the benefit of using these natural resources to grow as much as they have, um, and then asking these countries, these poor countries that are not only relying on them, but also producing these natural resources to about face. So. Um, it, it's a definitely a developed country agenda versus an emerging country agenda. Cool. Before we move on, I wanted to point our listeners to a newly redesigned focus.fool.com. There you'll discover a special offer to join the Motley Fool Stock Advisor newsletter for all industry-focused listeners. All Loyal IF listeners have access to a special discount on Stock Advisor that works out to $129 for a full two-year subscription. Just go to focus.fool.com to take advantage of this offer. Once again, that is focus.fool.com. And moving on to the second half of our show, and first on the docket, we've got a potential merger between chemical giants Dow Chemical and DuPont. Um, The deal is not finalized. Obviously, they're in advanced talks. Um, But what's the rationale for combining these two huge companies? Um, Well, I think A, possibly get some activist shareholders off their backs, um, and B, it looks like they're just going to split everything up once they do. Like, yeah, what were you saying? Reshuffling the deck or something? Basically, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, they're if they split off these divisions independently as two separate companies into these smaller divisions, they might not move the needle as much, but they can create giants in three separate sectors if they split these companies off after they combine. Um, I mean, have any cost savings been mentioned, or is it just like a? Focus you would have to thing? imagine that job cuts are on the table. I yeah. saw like it, it's they're very broad statements when they say stuff like right. that because Especially at this they stage. Ha- a deal isn't finalized in yeah. any way. But obviously, that's one of the reasons that you would do it is you bring together. Um, it's called a deal. This one's they're calling it a deal of equals, so they probably wouldn't even offer a premium for anybody's shares. It would right. just yeah. be like, hey, smash, yeah. and then crumble. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean. Like I, I think one of the great examples is they gave uh, is let's talk about agriculture. You know, they're a very lar- all both companies are very large in uh, fertilizer manufacturing as well as even doing some seed technology. And what they thought about doing is okay, let's just when we come together, we'll kind of put that agricultural segment into its own little realm. You know, we'll take the cost efficiency, job cuts, and who does what well and who doesn't do what well, and will make that its own company and make it competitive with, you know, somebody like the Mo- Monsanto's, Agrium, yeah, yeah. think places like that where they can be competitive in that in that specific space and have a larger market share in that specific space. Basically creating three much more cyclical businesses is what they would be doing. Um, investors could pinpoint right. exactly what they want to invest in. To put some numbers, what Tyler said, a Wall Street Journal shows that together they have 17% of world pesticide market. Um, a th- they would be the third largest supplier of crop chemicals. They would have 41% of the U.S. corn seed business and 38% of the soybean market. So, 
These aren't small numbers that we're tossing around. So you say three more cyclical businesses. That sounds kind of negative to me. Well, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the agriculture business that go, that right, floats in waves. Swings, yeah. um, and then their petrochemical business is impacted by oil prices, which is a cyclical business. And the third, I, I'm not sure what the third one would be. It looked like it was going to be uh, specialty products specialty and products, things. Okay, so um, like, it, I think one of the examples they gave Dow uh, was uh, Kevlar. Kevlar, yeah, okay. Dupont's one yeah. of their main big name products. That sounds like the least cyclical, but anyway. Yeah, um, but then I mean, you you look at a lot of this, and this would impact. I mean, not just investors, but consumers as well. I would be surprised if you go an entire day without touching something that was produced For with sure. a product yeah. from one of these two companies. And what makes it odd is, um, so when you get large mergers like this, one of the obvious things um, that comes up is. Regulatory approval and you know too much market share, like we're seeing with Baker Hughes Halliburton, they're running into a lot of regulatory yeah, approval. Yeah, over a year now. Yeah, and um, one of the reasons is is somebody gains too much market share, and you know there's the uh, antitrust laws related to having basically absolute dominance and control of a market where you can kind of price get, gouge customers and things like that. But what this is what why this one's weird. It says, "Oh, we're going to break up so we don't have regulatory issues." But you're going to break up into the specific segments of the, the market of the where you're going to be yeah. control, control of it. Yeah. So it it's like, how does that company kind of how is a regulatory environment going to look at that? It's like, yeah, you're smaller, but you're be beca- you're getting the advantages a- are still the same. Yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. Cool. Well, the final story of the day, dun dun dun. Kinder Morgan cuts its dividend. Yes, they uh, did. In a press release put out by the company titled, Kinder Morgan Announces 2016 Outlook. That sounds harmless enough, right? Yep. Uh, the company noted that they expect to pay quarterly dividends of 12.5 cents per share instead of the current 51 cents per share getting in the beginning in the fourth quarter of 2015 and into fiscal year 2016. This decreased ena- uh, this decrease enables the company to use a significant portion of cash flow to fund equity portion of its expansion capital requirements, eliminate the need to raise equity capital, and maintain a solid investment grade rating. Um, the stock was up on the news, so is this a good thing? Like. Long term, probably so. Yeah, it was up because that was yeah. the big overhang. Um, Everybody was pricing. They, they have to do something here yeah. pretty drastic. I mean, what was it? It's down 60% over right. this 30% year since Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, so you look at, uh, I think all the dividend investors were selling out because they're like, this has got to be cut. It's going to be cut. And then you maybe look at some longer term investors buying in yesterday and today because it's up a few percent today. Because the notes seem, I mean, I was reading this, I was like, this seems positive like you know what i mean (laughs) if your investment horizons three years or longer then sure it is because a lot of people are saying the dividend won't raise they won't be able to raise it until the next two or three more years um so you're you're still getting a near three percent they're talking about expansion as well i mean it's not like Uh, i'll pump the brakes on expansion just yet i mean because right now they just freed up some cash they're not going to tap the debt markets they're not going to tap the equity markets so the only cash they have available to spend outside of Financing debt and maintenance is this money they just saved from cutting the dividend, which is around a couple billion dollars. So it's no small change, but compared to a company like this, it is pretty small change when you're really thinking about growth to move the needle on a year over year basis. Did you ever think you'd see the day, Tyler? Yes, I did. did. (laughs) I I wouldn't say specifically Kinder Morgan. Right. But and that's kind of what I was talking about. But anyway, yeah. it, It seems to me that in this master, I think one of the, I guess, tangents and interesting co- things that I've seen about this is since this happened and there's been a lot of talk about the master limited partnership the pipeline space I know Kinder Morgan's not a master limited partnership it's a C corp but they act that way right and there's so much talk about it being a broken model or a flawed model that it's not it's a model that has been abused by management teams and pressured into unsustainable acts by shareholders and activists. I think I was actually reading the transcript from that announcement, and the first question from announcing the dividend cut was an analyst who said, well, when are you going to raise it again? And You're these, missing the point, It's a man. shift in mindset. Yeah. It's, yeah. These, companies, is required. these companies are being pressured by investors, Wall Street analysts, to raise these dividends at these almost breakneck paces uh, to keep up with inflation, to get yield, some sort of return over treasury bonds that are 2%. And it's led to these unsustainable 
management practices where it says, oh, we don't need to retain any cash flow to grow our business. We can just go to the debt and equity market. It's whenever the heck we want. And it, it that doesn't make sense over the long term. Companies that do this, it's it's kind of a reckless move. And you need to, in some ways, generate some internal cash flow and spend it wisely. To, to expect companies to, every quarter, we're going to give out all of our distributable cash flow and tap the debt markets when we need something, it, it doesn't work. Like I don't see why anybody would think that is a sustainable proposition over the long term. Got it. And actually, on that note, we have a uh, mailbag question that relates to MLPs, so maybe we can weigh in here. Uh, so before we wrap up, we have a listener mailbag from in- uh, Ignacio Salvo over Orlando, Florida. And you killed says, my father. Prepare you to ki- die. <laughs> <laughs> little little Sorry, Ignacio. Bride reference for everybody. Um, he knows how awesome his name is. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Ignacio writes, Hi, guys. I've started looking into what companies I could add to my portfolio to take advantage of the opportunities in the energy sector today. One of them is Spectra Energy Corporation. This company has nice margins, free cash flow, and a nice dividend. The problem I'm having is that there's also Spectra Energy Partners Limited Partnership. What's the difference between the two, and which might be the better choice? Love the show, Ignacio. Well, thanks for the uh, thanks for the props on the show. Um, so the difference between Spectra Energy and Spectra Energy Partners is the is that limited partnership, general partner relationship that you see very commonly among master limited partnerships. Spectra Energy Partners is a specifically a partnership that owns assets, pipelines, storage, logistics uh, assets, and they churn out cash. And the general partner, Spectra Energy, is basically the manager of those assets. And when it when it's spun off into the limited partnership, it's basically saying, hey, we're just going to own part of these assets and manage them, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to have direct ownership of those assets, not the company itself. And so, what happens is with that partnership, they pay a distribution, which goes back to unit holders, which in some cases a certain percentage goes to the general partner, and then the rest goes to the public unit holders. So, if you're looking at the limited partnership, you just directly own assets, versus at the general partnership, you own a company with management and everything that goes along with it. What are the risks? And if you own Spectra Energy, you own portions of Spectra Energy partners. So you're getting a you're getting a two for with that with yeah. that with those shares. And they Double also up. they also own another partnership, I believe. Yeah, DCP Midstream is yeah. another. So which smaller, but yeah, they own. So it. so getting more to um, his question, which one do you like more and why? Well, I personally like Spectra Energy, which is why I own it personally. Because you have to uh, double dip, or is it less risky? Well, or? Person, it's just the the fact that they own both MLPs, they get the distribution rights, so you get the benefit of these high payouts from Spectra Energy Partners, from DCP Midstream, and then you get the, also the benefit of um, just a regular corporate structure. You don't have the complexity of an MLP, which um, has shown recently to to really confound some day to day investors. It's something and that, annoying K one. Yeah, well, yeah, so there's, said, yeah, there's special, tax special tax special implications tax when implications. you own a partnership versus a general partner, um, and especially a partnership that is doing well because you have to pay taxes on their their performance rather than if if an MLP loses money that you don't, there's no special taxes for you. Um, Yada yada yada. Yeah. That's for you to talk to tax professionals about. But anyways, um, they're both paying high dividends and distributions. Expected to grow over the next few years. They're they've got a great region that they're operating in on the East Coast, up from Florida all the way up to the New England area, and a little bit in the Great Lakes in Canada. Um, and personally, I think that they have a solid customer base, ninety percent of which is is investment grade. A lot of downstream customers that aren't necessarily impacted by high oil or low oil prices. Um, so, and they don't have they have a big backlog of projects, but not nearly as big as what Kinder Morgan was promising. Um, and a lot of them are in underserved areas of the country. And just to kind of throw it out there, talking about that pressure of paying out all their cash flow. Spectra Energy Partners does not. They yeah they, they retain a certain conservatism percentage. wins the day right. <laughs> They're conservative with it. They retain some cash flow and use that to grow the business rather than consistently going elsewhere to find funding sources. And that you pay for that in the yield. Uh, it's around five and a half percent now versus a peer group of respectable, 7. but not 2. crazy. Yeah. Five five and a half percent is great. 
Yeah, um, yeah. who complains about 5% yield? Yeah, not 30 I. 30 year T bills at um, three. You know. And that's for Spectre Energy Partners. Its peer group is just over seven. So you're looking at a little bit lower on the yield, but if it's safe, if those companies have to cut their yield, 7.2 yeah. is, a, is a, an afterthought. Cool. Well, that is it for us, fools. If you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool.com. Again, that is industryfocus at fool.com. And as always, people on this program may have interests in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear on this program. For Tyler Crow and Taylor Muckerman, I am Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on. Fool on.